Hi, this is Lori Niles with Violinist.com, and I'm here with violinist Jennifer Coe, and she is performing this season with the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra, and she'll be doing the world premiere of the violin concerto called Traces by Nina Young. It's great to see you, Jennifer. It's great to see you. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, first of all, how did you come to the violin? I heard that you started in the Suzuki method. <laughs> Yeah, I was, it's kind of a long story, but um, my parents were both refugees during the Korean War. Um, so they spent their childhood actually kind of heading south. Uh, my mom walked from all the way from North Korea essentially to Busan, which was the only area that ended up not um, being held or being held by the Americans. They didn't have any opportunities. Um, even things like consistent school, much less like music lessons or swimming or anything like that. So I think when they came here, they wanted me to have everything they didn't have. And when I say everything, I mean like everything. It was like swimming, diving, gymnastics, rhythmic gymnastics, ice skating, um, and violin happened to be one of them. It was like the only opening um, at the local Suzuki school. So they were like, whatever, sure, violin. Um, so that's how I started. But I had this amazing um, first Suzuki teacher, Mrs. Davis, Mrs. Jo Davis. She's wonderful. Actually, we just celebrated her 90th birthday. And what I realized, it was like basically just only family. But what I realized was, oh, I started studying with her at three. So I know all of her kids. I know what they're doing. I know all of her grandkids and what they do. I know her grand great grandkids. Um, and I was like, oh, I guess it, it is because I've known her almost all my life. You kind of are family. Yeah. <laughs> so that was really, that's really great. And, but it's only because of her that I, I think I ended up going into music mm -hmm. because she told my parents that I had some kind of talent. I mean, the funny thing, though, is, you know, I recently I moved my parents to New York. Yeah. Um, and so I was going through like all of the stuff in the basement that you find like over like the 40 years they've lived there. And I found this video tape, like an old one, and I had everything digitized. And I remembered I looked at that clip and I was like, God, that sounds terrible. Who is that person playing? And it was me when I was like seven or eight. And I called Mrs. Davis and I was like, why on earth did you think I was talented at all? That sounded horrible. Um, but in any case, she was encouraging. She um, was right, too. <laughs> she was right. Uh, she said, oh, it's just because you didn't see yourself uh, in lessons. And I was like, I don't know. That sounded pretty bad. Um, so she actually, she found my next violin teacher. She advocated for me to to actually change teachers. And my parents both worked full time, so she actually drove me an hour each way for a year. She drove you herself, yeah. your violin And she teacher. attended oh the lessons, and then she took notes, and then she practiced with me. Oh my goodness. To make sure that I was like learning everything. Wow. I think what that taught me was that our choices in life really have the potential to change somebody's life. Mm. And mm -hmm. that was a gift she gave me. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like the only way I could ever repay that is to do the same sorts of things. You know, it makes me think of your project Alone Together. Um, can you describe that a little bit? It was during a time, this happened during the pandemic, and it was during a time when nobody, including composers, had work. Um, soloists didn't have work. What was your feeling behind that? You know, the pandemic broke out. Um, and then there were these shelter in place orders. And I remembered, actually, she just got the MacArthur. My last concert, um, right before the, you know, pandemic kind of took over, uh, was the world premiere of, of Courtney Bryan's violin concerto. Um, and then I came back to New York and every half hour, every single concert was canceling. And I was actually, I was still, I was in close touch with um, Nina Young and then also Missy Mazzoli. And of course, our, the first reaction, especially with, with both Missy and I, um, was panic because we lost all of our work. 
you know, I realized actually, you know, we're lucky. We didn't actually 100% lose the work. Our work was postponed um, because we're in a certain point yeah. um, where things weren't just purely canceling. And then I remember thinking back and, and when I first left school and it's so hard to go into music and it's really tough financially. Um, but on top of that, even artistically, uh, you start learning, you know, from experiences from other musicians. Um, and I realized actually it's way worse for the younger generation, not only in terms of, of finances, which is hard, and then put a pandemic on top of that, which just makes it 100% harder. But then also in terms of loss of experience, for some people it was like they weren't going to have their first string quartet premiered, so they wouldn't have that experience. Their f first orchestral piece was like canceled. So it was also about trying to bring exposure um, to these younger composers. Um, but essentially, it, the whole process was about doing micro commissions. Uh, so 30 second pieces uh, written for solo violin. And um, I went to my friends and colleagues who had uh, kind of institutional support or, or full time uh, salaried positions um, and asked them to uh, identify a younger freelance composer that they believed in or felt kind of musically connected to. At that time, they donated their work and then I commissioned uh, the younger composer. But actually what makes me the happiest is like when they've come to me and told me, oh, this person heard, heard my piece on, on the series during the pandemic and they commissioned me after. Mm. And that's actually for me, that was, that was the most satisfying. So your choice to do these small commissions turned into some more commissions for these composers and yeah. helped help them on their way, kind of like your teacher helped you. Oh, on, Mrs. Davis. I mean, I have so many people that helped me along the way. So I still feel like I have to, there's so many people I have to thank, including my last teacher, Jamie Laredo. So I feel like I'm not thanking everybody. <laughs> Felix <laughs> Gallimere, I'm going to just start making a whole list. Oh, I know Mr. Steinhardt has mm -hmm. been here in mm -hmm. California, and he was a uh, really great mentor as well. You know, it reminds me a lot that that we have a responsibility. Every single thing we do is a decision and it's a choice. And then that becomes a habit. Yeah. And then that becomes a whole lifestyle of yeah. how we live. And so every small decision we make, we have to recognize that that's a choice. And either it's about fulfilling something that's not only about yourself, that's greater than yourself, that's more like a life mission mm -hmm. versus just yourself improving. Of course, uh, we want to be better. And of course, it's my goal to, to be the best kind of musician that I can be and the best violinist that I can be. But much beyond that, it's what do you leave behind? What are you doing for other people? Yeah. Um, that I think it's much more important and much more significant. Mm -hmm. and in the long run makes a far larger um, impact yeah. in, in terms of building the world that you want also. Well, and this week you're gonna be premiering um, Nina Young's Violin Concerto, Traces. Can you tell me a little bit about how you met Nina Young and then a little bit about the concerto itself? So with Nina, actually, <laughs> it was funny because a lot of my friends were like, oh, there's like this composer, Nina, that lives in your building. And I, was, and I just hadn't met her um, in person, but I met all these people that had been staying in her apartment at different times. This is in New York City. Yeah, this yeah. is in New York. And I think actually I ended up meeting her. I went to hear a, a, a concert by ACO, American Composers Orchestra. And one of her pieces was being premiered there, and I was so impressed. Yeah. And then I think actually, when I thought about it after you and I spoke, I think the way I actually met her was I was doing a rehearsal, and she came to that rehearsal. And I think that's how we briefly met. And then eventually, um, our friends, mutual friends, introduced us for, for kind of like more in depth introduction, I guess. And then what led to the commission of a violin concerto, that's pretty major. And as I understand, she's a violinist 
yeah. herself. And so this, and it's her first violin concerto, mm -hmm. right? So this is a big deal for her. Yeah, I mean, I can't remember. It usually happens quite organically. So, oh yeah, so I was, after that concert, I was looking at more of her, her music, um, not only just for solo violin, but in general. And there was a piano quartet that I really loved called Sparrow Lucha. Um, so I started playing that. There were several other pieces for violin and electronics uh, that I started performing with her, actually. And then it just felt like a natural thing to ask her to write a concerto because I loved her musical language. She's so unique, um, imaginative. I think the coloration, the lyricism is very unique to her. Um, and then the fun part, I mean, honestly, in a lot of ways, this is like the most technically challenging, but it's kind of actually fun because, um, because she is a violinist, there are things like running thirds and tenths and stuff, <laughs> which usually, like nowadays, people don't really write <laughs> so much. So it's, but she also, she knows how to write it for violin, which is like in terms of even, it's hard to describe like patterns and stuff. And I remembered I told her like during the pandemic, I don't know, on a personal level, I was like, oh, I should just go through all the Pagni Caprices again. Um, and oh, I'm just gonna go through all of the um, like Carl Flesch scales. And I don't know, so maybe that got like planted in her head a little bit and, and that's where these different sections came in. Um, but I don't know that the audience would necessarily like notice it. It was more like on a violinistic um, level. It was it was fun for me so to see. It has like violin in jokes. This this concerto I don't know if maybe it's jokes <laughs> as much as like just um, references. Maybe references traces. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe you started references. this yeah. whole thing started before the pandemic, and then mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about like how your relationship. You guys were both in the same apartment complex, alone yeah. during a pandemic. I mean, I have to say it was terrifying. In March and April of 2020, um, I think both she and I were experiencing it literally like five floors apart. Um, and because at that time, uh, New York City was so um, being really devastated by the pandemic, in terms of literally human loss of life. Um, it was terrifying. We, we didn't even leave our apartments. I think, or I know <laughs> that neither of us interacted with another human being for six and a half weeks. That is a really person. long time. And I think we just, or at least I can say I started losing it. There is something that I posted on Instagram, um, <laughs> but I think most people haven't seen it. And I, I had considered like removing it because it kind of shows like how crazy and intense and like it had gotten like for both she and I. Yeah, so if you see that, you can kind of see like where psych psychologically we were unraveling. <laughs> so you were psychologically unraveling and you reached out to each other, it sounds like. Yes, but it was kind of amazing because it, human beings really are social animals because when we, f we decided to pod together. Mm -hmm. So when we finally did meet up, it was like, I could literally feel like a chemical start to flow through my body. Wow. And she did as well. So for a while then it was just you in a pod together. How long was that? You know, we didn't have things like masks mm -hmm. and New York is such a concentrated area of human beings. Yeah. So like even walking into hallways, all of that is so uh, kind of tight that it, it was still quite scary for a long time. Um, and eventually, I think once masks happened or we were able to access them and uh, once we learned kind of how it was spread, then we started doing more things outside. We did things like I would never normally do. Like, well, I mean, I did it as a student, but we started biking outside. And then I remembered the moment that like, uh, I, you know, at that time it was like video concerts. Yes. Um, 
so the first time I got like a video concert where I actually could have income, I was like, okay, biking done. <laughs> <laughs> but for a while we were like going down like the Hudson Greenway um, on bicycles. Well, so how do you feel about having this um, violin concerto come to life with Leco? Oh, I love Leco. I mean, I, I love the individuals. I love the orchestra. I love the individual musicians in the orchestra. First of all, they're great musicians, but second of all, they are such dedicated um, musicians to to serve the music. Yeah. And that is something that I just admire so much. I remembered actually Margaret, uh, I think this was before we did the Ligeti violin concerto. She, I think she actually called me and she was like, don't you think we need extra rehearsal? Yeah. And I was like, yes, I think we need extra rehearsal. So the concert master doesn't always call you to talk about stuff like that. Well, to actually request more rehearsals, yeah. not, not always, no. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. And you know, what's the difference between sort of playing with a chamber orchestra and and a full orchestra is it's a sort of a different feel i tend to see like kind of music as a whole it's it's whether it's a chamber orchestra or a large orchestra or somebody that's like in a quote unquote different genre um i kind of see it all the same it's like great musicians bad musicians <laughs> um good musicians you know like it's great artists bad artists um so of course it just depends on the on the ensemble. One thing I can say about Lyco is that they're really a group of excellent, excellent musicians, mm -hmm. um, and they have the kind of flexibility of playing, of course, both chamber music, I think, solo things, um, as well as orchestral things, and and you can really feel it when you play with them. When it comes to a brand new piece like this one, how, I mean, you're, you're someone who does this all the time. You, how many commissions have you done? Or, you know, how many pieces have you premiered? Or do you have, do you I have think a it's count? over a hundred, actually, That's at this a point. Lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's fun. I mean, even for, we haven't gone into rehearsal yet for, for Nina's piece, but I was trying to think about it and I realized, you know, the, the fun part is that you're, you're walking into a situation where everything is possible. So I can look at a score and I can be like, okay, I think I'm gonna hear the vibraphones here and I, I'm pretty sure I can hear the harp here. I'm pretty sure I'll hear the entrance of the piccolo. But sometimes you just don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and so what's really, uh, what I really enjoy is not only the discovery, um, of, of the piece coming together and how it breathes and how it even acoustically, because all, always the acoustic aspect of it, the physicality of it, uh, once it comes out of your head into physical bodies um, is really fascinating to me. I think for the composer as well, because of course it's been in their minds. And then for me, it's been in my mind uh, for a long time. So then to actually have it physicalized is is an amazing thing. Um, and then what I actually, what I love, which we have to do as musicians anyhow, is that kind of uh, very quick um, transitions and listening and responding to that. If we're doing the Brahms concerto and let's say uh, the oboist takes a little bit of time, extra time here or there, then you adjust to it in the moment, right? Yeah. And here it's expected that everybody does that. It, not expected, but the best experiences happen when everybody is adjusting to what the music sounds like. And so in a way, sometimes I feel like um, premieres are the ideal way of making music. And that experience is something that we should bring to every other piece that we do. It's, it's this sense of discovery. It's the sense of limitless possibilities and decisions, musical decisions, and very quick adjustments and really needing to listen to each other. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I enjoy doing new music because it's, those are the things that I can bring back to older music. And actually um, with older music, at least for me, I feel like um, the most important thing is to look at it like it's new. So even for, for me, like with, violin parts or scores, I actually, 
I will get new scores and new parts every time because I don't want to just go into the habit. Oh, I've always done this fingering. Oh, I've always taken time here. Oh, I've always, you know, this is what's comfortable. This is what I've always done. So that's kind of how I, I approach older music as well. But then that does mean sometimes I'm not, uh, the performance style doesn't necessarily go exactly with traditional performance practice. Like I'm certainly aware of that because I've come from such a traditional background, you know, like Curtis and Marlboro um, Music Festival. What's fun for me is to be able to like really look at the score and make decisions from that and not necessarily from all of the performance practices that have happened before. So you literally get a clean slate, mm -hmm. a, a new version of the music and start yeah. over again. I mean, so that was like why I, I mean, I feel like every project I do is basically reflective of a reflection of like my own thinking process. So that was one of the reasons I did two by four, which was a project that I premiered here with Leiko actually. And that was with my teacher, Jamie Laredo, and it was for double violin concerti. Um, and that was really about engaging with that question of what do we what performance practices do we inherit and decide to take? How do we change? And so Jamie was a great teacher, um, but he and I do play differently. Yeah. The great thing about him is he, uh, as a teacher, he really encourages you to find your own voice and he does not discourage that. So you do see how things shift and change. Having studied with him, it was, I also realized that it is important that you find your own voice um, and that it is okay. It's not about copying what had come before. Do you remember the first time you ever did like a piece of new music where you were just, that was it, you know, you, you had to figure out what to do with it? I think the first time I did, of course I had done new music like because I studied with Felix Gallimere. So anyhow, it felt weird because like, you know, I think by the time I was 18, I'd gone through learning probably all of the standard repertoire, yeah. right? And by that point, I was moving into Baird Concerto, Bartok Concerti. So it just felt weird. Why would I stop learning <laughs> repertoire at a certain age? It was like, why would that, why, that just seems so strange to me. But it was, I do remember actually specifically the, that the John Zorn Concerto was the first piece that was like literally a couple months old when I when I first performed it and and that was working with a composer that I didn't know. I had recorded Giancarlo Minotti's violin concerto, but I had known him as a person for years from Spoleto Music Festival. And I remember being very, very um, scared about it. But now when I look back, I realize every single thing that I was scared about doing was an incredibly important thing that I did. Um, so that was the first kind of concerto, and that was, I think, really the, the first, and I was terrified of doing it. Yeah, what were you scared about? First of all, it was hard. <laughs> 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 Second of all, it was, you know, really having to make every single decision and finding strategies, even in so far as, like, fingerings. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of his stuff is super high and it's moving up and down. Yeah, so that that was was scary. And then making all of these purely musical decisions with absolutely no performance tradition from before. Mm -hmm. But then that kind of started my, once I got through the fear, that's kind of what started my kind of love of that process. I mean, now you've done it a hundred times. <laughs> yeah, but then I remembered the other thing that was terrifying to me was performing Bach, solo Bach in public. Mm. But having done that was one of the most satisfying and important things I've done, yeah. I think. Um, playing Einstein was one of the most terrifying things for me, but that led to one of the most artistically satisfying and I think uh, significant things in my lifetime, which was actually then became a combination of working with both Robert Wilson and Lucinda Childs to do all six sonatas and partitas staged and choreographed. So all of the things I've been terrified of actually uh, have led to incredibly meaningful, important things in my life. Yeah. So in other words, everybody should do what they're terrified of. <laughs>
<laughs> and, and don't be afraid of failure. Like, it's okay um, to fail. It's really about how you pick yourself up after that. And it doesn't kill you. It really doesn't. It might feel really bad for a while, but <laughs> it does not kill you. <laughs> so you live in New York City. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about LA? <laughs> Actually, I, kn I know like there's, there seems to be this weird East Coast, West Coast rivalry. I don't quite get it because I actually, I love Los Angeles. It's so I love New York too. different from New York. And actually every time I'm here and I think a lot of the most recent times I've been here have actually been with Laco. And, and every time I come here, I'm like, I should really live in Los Angeles. Why does a little part of you at least want to live in Los Angeles? It's not a little part. Is <laughs> it's not a little part. It's like a very different, I think, kind of philosophy of living. Um, New York is so, it's so densely populated and it's so, it's like a very direct city in the sense that everything's like moving very quickly all like in this direction and if you know it's clashing everybody's still moving in their directions but LA it's there's a kind of freedom because I think maybe even because of the the landscape in a way mm -hmm. uh, there's a kind of more experimental freedom that's New York does have that kind of experimentalism uh, but it's it's a different kind and it's a different language even though I've argued with people about this, but I think I have to admit that LA has the best Korean food. Outside of Korea. <laughs> yeah, or and it's, the Korean food is better than New York. I'm so sorry, New York and New Jersey, but I think it's absolutely true. <laughs> And it does make me sad because I would like to say that New York and New Jersey has the best Korean food, but it, it's not. It's in Los Angeles. Yeah, and then I think it's just I have so many friends here that it's, it's also, um, I feel really drawn to the city. Maybe I should just split my time. I feel like I should split my time between New York, LA, and then Hawaii for surfing. Oh, but I could nice also surf. surf in LA, so. You could. Right? And maybe not as much as in Hawaii, so. <laughs> Maybe the three places together. <laughs> Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us today and telling us all about your projects and your collaboration with Leco. How do we make a heart? Does this work? Yes. <laughs> thank you, Leco. Thank you, LA. <laughs>